I'm always happy to have these questions about the visual order uh, because that's really the thing I'm trying to clarify more than anything else. Um, just do we have um, do we have multiple sort of senses of order, senses of sets of relationships, I guess is the right way to say it. Do we have multiple ones in our minds? And if you're an impressionist, you must. Um, I've heard people say, you know, when you're, you know, and, and by the way, that question I think comes up today of the backstraggler, and uh, so that's a good question. Uh, but the backstraggler, before I go into these points, I want to just mention the backstraggler. The uh, somebody, uh, one of my fellow students with Gamel said uh, once that uh, when he's trying to find the backstraggler, he looks at the drawing. Now, if you consider the drawing everything, like 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 Hale talks about it, then that would make sense. But if you think of the drawing as the spatial, the two-dimensional world, the drawing, you know, that thing that goes around like this and is up here and down here, this world, that's a different world from the world of values. The world of values is a dark to light world that goes, you might say, this way, right? And that's the beginning of understanding because we're talking about a three-part world and the three parts are drawing the two-dimensional world of the, of, of the spatial. And usually that's what we think of as drawing. And you, it, it's impossible to argue that there's not a connection between values, color, and uh, drawing. But um, but the other one is um, but the but the but the other one is values, and then there's color. So if you just be sure you know that whenever you're working on this project, I keep on trying to reduce things down to their most reducible, shall we say? So when you're talking about color, it's very easy to say color has three components: that is the hue, the red, yellow, or blue. It's relative darker lightness and its intensity, the intensity of the color. And I'm going to talk about intensity in an upcoming video. Uh, again, I'll try to do that as a more of a demonstration um, on behalf of Jeff. But uh, don't hold your breath, Jeff. I don't know when I, if I'm going to get to it. It might be soon. Um, so let's just read uh, these two questions. The reason I'm doing this partially is because I have three people somewhat talking about the same thing. I'm going to address the first two people more or less in the same conversation, and then I'm going to talk about the, the other question that comes in under the same heading, okay? So the first two, which are from Elizabeth uh, and Sheila, Elizabeth G., I'm trying to understand your comparison of spatial and visual order. Could you uh, elaborate on the difference a bit more? So that's what I'm going to do. The spatial uh, meant the biggest box around things, and the visual order meant stronger to weaker. What exactly? <laughs> okay, I do like that kind of a question. But actually, as I said, it's just what I'm here for. I really want to talk about this. It's so significant, and I say that I'm meaning. And I say that meaning, if you are trying to paint the visual impression, if you're an imaginative painter, that world. Um, I still think you really should know that world before you know anything else. Uh, and I say imaginative painter, meaning illustrator, those things. I think that piece, that slice of life, that understanding of how to paint what you see in front of you, the authority and power, um, uh, objectively, accurately in all these ways, is a huge piece of being credible as a painter. But I mean, there's a bunch of formulas in that world that you can get away with because the story winds up dominating and being the thing. It's harder to do that in an impressionist world where the truth of the visual impression, we all know there's something about some falseness that we all recognize. So it's a little harder, in my view, to get away with it. Uh, the, the, and I'm not saying the illustrator is necessarily trying to get away with it. I'm just saying he's got a different necessity. You've got to tell a good story. And if your colors and things work pretty good, that's fine. Which is sort of true of any imaginative work, right? Uh, based on a narrative, shall we say. So the second question, I'm getting off track here. The concept of the visual order, this is now uh, from Sheila. I th boy, Sheila, I, th I just automatically put that in there. I think. This is from Wooden Lipstick, so I think it's Sheila, but I hope it's not Ilya, but uh, oops. <laughs> a correction for another day, right? Uh, the concept of the visual order is causing me a nice paradigm shift and is changing my humble uh, drawing practice for the better, for which I'm very grateful. A little question, though. I don't understand what a backstraggler is. Is it a major mistake you should figure out before moving forward? So um, uh, I, I guess actually I, t I jumped this thing in there because of the visual order thing, but the backstraggler, um, just to get it sort of 
into focus and out of the way. I've already responded to her online, by the way, and you can look at the, under the comments of my response there. Sometimes useful to have a written response and not to have to listen to the extended verbals that I have to do on a video. But um, uh, because she's talking, and I guess I must have grabbed this uh, because the concept of visual order is uh, just mentioned. But the back stragglers, for me, it's always the back straggler of the general impression, right? So the back straggler is that sheep on a hillside that's, that's getting far out, it's getting more and more distant from the flock and is thereby becoming endangered. <laughs> and you've got to go get it before it winds up getting lost or getting uh, nibbled, shall we say. Um, so, uh, but when she says it's a major mistake, you should figure out before moving forward. The answer is that thing which is least like the general impression. And you might look at the previous video, I think in Numbers 227 probably deals with, I'm thinking it does deal with this, uh, 220, I'm sorry, two, yeah, 227, two, uh, somewhere in there. It deals with something to do with this. But, but um, if you're watching the thing as a whole, that part which is least like. So if you put down just three notes, you already have things that could be least like of the three and you want to correct them until they're, so you already may have a back straggler. Now you're putting down three notes to get the set of the notes. If you're just an impressionist putting notes around, you'll certainly not leave a note that's faulty once you get two and three other notes. You're trying to get the key of the painting to that, you know, find the color, color plan for the painting. Color value plan, I really should say. Uh, but you'll already have things that are not like. So, so don't think that's something when you get the whole painting covered, all of a sudden there's this thing that shows up. Uh, and also don't get the idea that it's not an object. I mean, it's a, that, it, that it's an object that's wrong. It's, you know, it's a, we, we think in terms of the world of masses, and this is kind of begins to be the introduction, introduction to what the other question is, which is the uh, visual order versus spatial. But we talk about, when you're an impressionist, you're talking about value units, about, about spots spots of value and their relationship to other spots by value and then in other ways, right? By location on the page. So there's a dark spot here and there's a dark spot down here. That angle to those two spots is a big deal. Or the relative darkness of this, if it's a, say the dark is dark and then you have a gray down here and then you have a, a, the lightest light somewhere else. What is the relationship between those three values? Uh, if those things aren't correct to each other when you're watching the whole, then you'd want to make sure that they were before you move along. If it was, if, as you came along, you thought to do, well, I think this would be helpful to bring this in next. And then you don't conform it or allow it to conform the others, help the others to become better. Uh, then you should put that time in, right? And that's where it really helps you to sort of debrief. When you make your next note, stand back and look at it in relation to the others, correct it in relation to the others, and do that each time you bring a new note in. And I don't care if you're just talking about the color or the location, it wouldn't matter, the value. So that, uh, but if you keep that in mind, Gamel's idea was the back stragglers that, it used to use the expression least like, that area that's least like. So the like, what you're trying to do is make a likeness and that part that's least like. Well, we used to always get into it and have like 40 things least like and it was really, really a pain in the neck. You never knew where to begin. Which is why the way I think about this is if you talk about your strong players first, and your majors first, your major, you know, your, your major values and things like that, you should be able to set, like what's your darkest, dark and lightest light? Those kinds of things you can make decisions about. Uh, and, um, and what I mean to say is you can choose those things. You can choose whom, whom you will serve. So um, right away at the beginning, you're going to have back stragglers just by the value you put down and the color note you put. This is not painting now. If it's just drawing, then it's just values and locations and then it'll, give, then it'll be things like shape and all that stuff. So, uh, but each member, each of these classifications has to be handled separately, right? So uh, now, so now we're going to just talk about. So that's the back straggler idea. And do get back to me if that's unclear. I should think just for. A, I'll try to come back to that. And if I think of anything else, or as I go along, if I think of anything else related to the back straggler, uh, wooden lipstick. <laughs> I'll get back to you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I can't remember which one you are. Okay. Uh, so back to Elizabeth G. I'm trying to understand my comparison of spatial, his, your comparison of spatial and visual order. Could you elaborate on the differences a bit more? And so I'm going to show you a picture, and I'm going to have some fun with you. And I'm going to show you my uh, advertisement. I'm going to use these two images from a previous intensive. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, from the ad for the present, the upcoming pres uh, intensive 
<laughs> painting workshop, which I think I posted uh, to you guys, but I'm doing it. Now I'm still putting it out there. I'm going to talk about the two images here. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Mary Catherine for the um, setup, and then uh, Lynn did a study of it when Mary Catherine was out of the area uh, for a, for an extended period of time. She did it just as a just to do a study of the you know try to paint something in the visual order, which is what I was teaching in the intensive way I do this. So this is from last year's intensive. This is from Mary Menifee, and this is from uh, Lynn uh, Melman. So. Uh, so to get out of my advertising, okay, it's it's five days a week, June twenty first to July thirtieth, six weeks, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so I really try to bring the Boston School way of thinking, that is, say, visual order impressionism, uh, uh, into um, you know into full view. Try to lay it on, on on people so that they can actually work it out. Uh, you know, it takes such a long time to work this out. Um, in other words, to sort out because you've got so many habits that are related to a different way of working. But I still I think I can get mostly get this across to you what the rougher idea is, and I really do try to get it to you big. And we're doing, lots, as I said, there's lots of hours, lots of work hours, and I'm in the studio lots of hours. I think I'm in three days a week for six weeks. Um, and I think the last two weeks I'm in five, how many days a week? Am I in five days a week the last two weeks? So, um, all right. So that's my advertisement. <laughs> Uh oh, or did I lose my? It's not moving. All right, now it is. There we go. I found a way to do it. All right, so let me hit laser. And all right, now we're while well, we're moving. So, um, so the difference between the visual order and the See, everything is visual order, right? <laughs> and one says the way we do it, everything is just done by visuals, right? So it's not like we're talking about realism. So, but in the visual order, the way I'm speaking about it, there are two dimensions. Just like I said, there are three dimensions in painting. There's color, and there's values, and there's and what we call uh, what we call line. In this world, there is the what I, so the line that would be the two-dimensional world. That's just the stuff that's you know how far is this thumb from this finger and how how wide is that distance? Am I showing you on the wrong side again? No, I'm okay. And how wide is that distance compared to this say this height right here or this compared to that? That's spatial. How big is this compared to the say to the finger? How big is this whole hand comparatively? Those are spatial. Everything's. And by the way, when I say two-dimensional, the world we do as, a, as an impressionist, the world we have reduced the world in our imaginations to two dimensions. We don't see the world three-dimensionally anymore. We just see the world. In fact, the world isn't the world. It's just color blobs. Okay, so it's just a question of organizing color blobs, and that's what that's what since way before Sargent, most people. Uh, I was even observing that about Chardin, that these people. And remember, now we're talking post Velasquez. These people realized the world was simpler and it was reducible. And to get the likeness of the thing in front of you, uh, it was reducible to to values and shapes and where they land in a page. Values, shapes, colors, where things land. Um, so, in the spatial sense, we're talking about that. In the value sense, we're talking about contrast. We're talking about darkest darks and lightest lights. It has nothing to do with this, does it? It has to do with something else. You know, how do you say darkest darks and lightest lights visually? So if you're talking about drawing, everybody can think go around the shape, you know, this wide, or it's, it's oval, and the height, therefore, of this egg is, 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 is half of its width. You know, that stuff is understandable. And, I'm not, and when I say, but I say the values world is different. The values world says somehow or other you have to have a different construct in your mind. But, and that's where, for example, the use of the idea of lost and found comes in. What would lost and found, and an idea like that, have to do with drawing in a, in a two, what, the two-dimensional world, what would it have to do with the two-dimensionality of things? Where things land this way and how high something is to a width or what these two points are in relation. What would, value, what would lostness have to do with that? It doesn't mean that everything we do, including lostness, can't be made, can't, the relationships of its point at which something is lost can't be related to something else by angle or spatially. It can, right? But when we start talking about values, there is a contrast thing that kicks in. And so the high contrast thing, and now I'll point at it, the high contrast thing, like the edge of this pot, with a, that has the sharpest edge, will project to your eye stronger than other things. This isn't a coincidence of life. I mean, a, sorry about that. The way it's put down here, these are just color values, aren't they? But you can see that this has more projectivity to your eye 
than this one does, right? This, now, again, just blur your eyes down a little bit and you'll see that this stays point, pointing at your eyes. Maybe the second one is this little guy down here or that one. Maybe that's the third one. You can see that this is well behind them, the fourth one. And when you get to the contrast between these two values, you cannot hardly see a difference. So you can see that this feels way forward in, a in, a, in an abstract sense, visually projective sense. And we're going to get to your question, uh, Andy, um, which is, has to do with the reality of that. But right now what we're talking about is visual order is, so there's a certain projective order and it doesn't mean that it's really front or back. Like this thing, this thing is more in front of this, but this is more projective than that, right? Uh, you know, since I'm talking about this, let me just go to Andy so he's on the page with us of the questions in your mind too. I, 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 maybe this isn't wise, but I think it's okay since I've already covered the most of Elizabeth's question. But Andy says, could you clarify whether the visual order is related to the distance of objects in a painting? For example, edges in the background of a painting are often softer uh, in paintings which give you a sense of depth. However, I wonder if you could have an object for far in the distance of a painting come to you quicker than an object closer in space that wouldn't come to you as quick. Now, I was just showing you that. So, and so that idea of quickness, that sounds like more like the Meldrum conversation, but the speed at which a projection. But I'll, I mean, there's the relative projectiveness. Uh, and in the relative projectiveness world, by the way, the, the feeling of, of this thing jumping more than that, which I could see myself. Oh, yeah, I guess maybe in the picture you're looking at, you see my collar jumping more than other things. It jumps more than my beard. It comes to your eye faster. And that's because of the contrast. But that's purely visual. You can see if you blow your eye, that me and this and this guy over here, that this collar and that guy over there have the strength, right? I can't see my lower collar here because of the screen, but uh, maybe that has more. But I'm simply saying that you can see that these are these these are, these are what we call the most projective points. Make of that description what you will, but you can see that that's in the world of lost and found. The most found is the one that comes to your eye most easily. Your eye is just not having to struggle to see those things. It has to struggle to see the low contrast guys or the soft edges. So, um, so, but what does it mean in terms of real space, right? And the answer, of course, is nothing, but let's talk about that. As we, let's go back and then talk about the other things and that. Uh, so I hope this makes sense. Does having an object in the distance come to you quickly break the illusion of depth in your painting? That's a, that's a fun question. And of course, you're looking at my, me and those things are happening and I'm not having my sense of depth. My nose is still out in front of my collar. What's that about, right? <laughs> <laughs> in, in theory, anyway. <laughs> so let's go. Let's go. I'm going to go back to a different picture in a second for Andy, but I want to have you to all have that in mind about the relative projectiveness. So here you can see a bunch of pots in the foreground here, and you can't, and they don't have any projectivity. This nose way back there comes out in front of these, but that doesn't mean anything. Those are just words. Does it really come out in front? Only if you think abstractly about the projectiveness of effects. So these are just effects, and there's strength of effects. They have nothing. We don't say, therefore, there's a, there's, a, there's a relationship between reality because we're not doing anything with reality. We're just doing value relationships, chromo relationships, and you may as well just call it that effect relationships, right? And that world is what it is. We're, we don't need to be clever. We don't need to know all the second levels of what they really, you know, how it creates depth. But one thing you do know with the way we do this, though, is that it creates depth in a more profoundly accurate way than other ways of working than the realism outline based way of working. And uh, which is why you have to master the idea of light. Uh, and so we say light, but effects is all a light proposition. It's contrast. High contrast with sharp edges produces the idea of light. Whether we mean actual light like daylight and things like light in that wrong sense. <laughs> but so that's how we talk about light effects. But when I say effects, you could say I mean light effects. I just mean effects. There are light effects like this part here, inside here, that has a strongish uh, effect of coming to your eye. This does here more maybe than the edge does. It has a projectiveness. So it isn't all about the edge, you know. There's other situations that cause certain things to come to your eye more. And, uh, and that's one of them, like the, the rising of the form. So the highlight in here may come to your eye. It may actually be in your eye more than certain other edges that actually have contrast, like in here. And you can see the feel of that it seems to come to your eye more. So don't put this into a box. I'm just saying in the simplest sense of the word, the thing with the highest contrast and the sharpest edges comes to your eye more. But here he's got a significantly background one with relatively sharp edges and, and, uh, and, and middle contrast. 
And you can see that it's in, in like say in relation to this, it comes to your eye more. So, but that's what, what's all we mean, uh, Elizabeth, by the visual order is there is a visual order that has nothing to do with, it's spatial, it, has a, it creates a spatial sense, but it's not spatial in the same sense as, as real space is. So, uh, but to make all this stuff go back and to make this feel forward, that's, that's made out of many, 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 many different things. And in one sense, it's, it's, you know, as you say, it's too wonderful for us. It's hard to understand. But when you put all these spots down the way they are and you have never thought about how deep it is, you're going to be right anyway if you get the contrast right, the edges right, and the intensities of the colors, you know, and the colors right, you're going to have, it's going to have the sense of this being way in the front and that being way in the back. And that's assuming other things too. Like there are things like uh, some of the effects are produced by, by, by elements that produce the sense of perspective, the sense of front and backness by, by um, location on the tabletop, for example. But you never know what all contributes to this total impact. All I'm saying is if you get the visual order of the edges right, you're going to be in the game way early and, and you're going to start, your picture is going to start going 3D on us in a very nice way. But when we're talking about the visual order, we just mean, could you just ignore what it is and just do what it does and get it to do, like contrast, get the contrast relationships right to each other? Just like we want the chromal relationships right, the value relationships right, and all the stuff related to shape right. We want the heights right to the widths. We want the points right to each other by angle. You know, so there's many, many, many things in this little old world. And, all, all, and we mean by that. So that's what our world is organized of, is the visual stuff. It's a values-based world, right? And, um, and yet, and so, what val and so I said that basically the painting, and this is now talking as a tonalist, painting is just, um, well, our guy said the right color, the right value, and the right place. That's all there is to it. Easy to understand, hard to do. Part of the hard to do this is because you don't want to let go of what it is. You want you think that somehow knowing in your mind that it's a that it's a certain kind of flower will help you make it better. It won't. But but seeing color relations will help you to get that flower. Um, but in the spatial world, if you remember that all we have to work with is values: how dark, how light, and what these values do where they meet, and the relative order of those things. Now, in the case of contrast, we're talking about the relative order of contrast. I call them effects because I won't settle for contrast being contrasty and not producing the effect. But if you get the relativeness, if you get the most, like if you get this guy here to be really hyper contrasty, or if you get him any contrast and just make all the other guys right in relation to that, you'll still have the visual order, right? You'll still have that sense of who's in front spatially, who's not spatial, sorry, who's in front visually, not spatially, okay? And remember, that's your goal, right? It's just to have the spatial world or just be organized in the spatial world. I, I try to tell people we're just like librarians. We, you know, we're just keeping things in alphabetical order, you know? And uh, so the world visual in front of us, when you have a scene that's fixed, a portrait sitter, an interior, a still life, when you have a scene that's fixed and your job is, or cast, <laughs> and your job is just to paint what you see, well, that's the easiest job that there is because all you have to do is stop knowing anything and just start talking about what do we see? If weren't for values, we couldn't see anything. And where they meet, we see the most. And there's, and there's the relationship between where things meet and where other things meet, and they make points, and there's angles between those points, and so on and so forth. And they create boxes in the abstract. Yeah. So I'm going through it, I think, as much as you need to. Um, again, I want to just re repeat this idea that the lost, found thing, um, like in, in, Mary, in Mary's painting here on the left, which is still in a word my... Where'd my drama thing go? All right, now where are you? I lost my laser. There it is. Uh, this area here isn't d drawn because there's nothing useful in it. So there's, there's priority. So we have two sides to the visual order. One is there's the order of priorities, which in a sense drives what you draw next, right? What you put down next, which articulates a better word, next. But it doesn't entirely. In other words, so we could say, well, why don't we just be purists? And let's say, this is the strongest thing, let's go put it in. And this is the second, let's put that in. Well, that could all be very nice, except the problem is you have a composition to place well on the page. So you need to know not only where that is, but you need to know where, where things are exiting, 
Uh, we talk about things like exits. We talk about distances from this side over here. And you have the whole thing itself and it's all of its proportions to deal with. So you have to do things. What I'm going to talk about now, the strategy of, of the two-dimensional world. And that is what's the top and bottom or the left and right. And so you'll set up something. In this case, you, this person probably used, Mary probably used the point of this thing and said, that's going to just about go out of the picture. So I'm going to fix that so I don't have any dangers and I don't want to risk it going out. And I'm going to, because I, because I'm doing that, I'm going to go ahead and find the location of something down here, maybe pick that one. And I'm going to keep those in mind through my viewfinder. And I would have found those looking with the viewfinder. And I'm going to then say, all right, so if that's the height, then what are the widths? And where, do, or, or where does one of these land? And you could say this, or you could pick this. And then it just becomes a question of how wide is this when you look at this and this, and so on, right? In the beginning, you set a top and bottom and a move left spot left or right, but that's just spatial, okay? But each time you do this, you, you do the visual order as well. And the visual order says, this guy's strong, this guy's less so, and this guy's less so yet. And you'll see the color differences and all those sorts of things. You'll see the edge differences. You'll, so I'm suggesting that instead of just working from this, we're setting top and bottom, but we're still going visual. We're still making the relative contrast right to each other. And right there in that spot, you have the visual order of the effects, right? The weak effect versus the strong effect of those three. And you begin to set up the spatial order, which is the composition. So that's the sort of summary view. I hope I haven't forgotten anything. And so I'm going to now walk you over to uh, Andy's, and his question was um, about the um, um, having an object in the distance. Does that having it come to you quickly? Does it break the illusion of depth in your painting? And I think Andy's already knows that the answer is no, it doesn't. And but it's one of those things that's funny because a lot of people will say that so and so sergeant or somebody uh, does keeps sharp edges away from the sides of the frame and stuff like that. Uh, but what's very interesting is that, it, it, let's just talk about the visual order of the edges. If you do it simplistically, well, let's just talk about this picture. And I, by the way, I found this online. I want to thank whosoever tavern that is. That's the something in the skiff in or something like that. Sorry, I can't remember the name. I see the name on there, but thank you. I just randomly chose this in a hunt for some tavern shots and for something else I was looking for. So thank you, whoever you are. I think this is in England somewhere. But if you blur your eye at this painting, really, really blur down, your eye is going to be talking about a spot like this one, maybe, as a strong place, a spot like this one, maybe, as the highest contrast place, or this, or this, right? Now, you should be able to see that this, this one here is well behind that one, and yet this one appears to have more contrast, probably, than this one. That's going to be... Now, by the way, I say probably... I speculate in my mind which one it is, but what at the end of the day, I just put them down, make them what I think they should be, and then I watch what, what they're doing, which one does, whether they do the right thing in relation to each other. And I highly recommend the trial and error sort of approach to Impressionism. You, know, you put it down, and, and you, you, you don't just say, did I get it right, did I get it right? You put it down and watch it to something and make the adjustments until they are right to each other. But even when you're trying to figure out, so look at this incredibly strong effect, right? Look at this edge here. Now, which is stronger? I'm talking about the red meeting the white thing here. Uh, and this, by the way, could be the whole summary of your question. You see the right edge of this strip of steel or whatever it is has no contrast or very low contrast. It does have an edge. But you can see that could be said to be miles behind this one as it, when it comes to effect, this front edge. But you're both right in the same place. <laughs> They're within an inch of each other, roughly, right? So how could they? So so there's no damage to the to the sense of forwardness or backwardness. Backwardness is there, and yet here this old house is low contrast, and why does it feel like it's in front of this high contrast area? So you don't have. I used to wonder about that myself, and I remember, you know, you really don't have to ask the question because you also have other things working for you. Like the, looking, see where looking, you can see the ground line, you can see by by perspective how things are landing. You can see that this overlaps. That this house overlaps that one. Therefore, it's in front. So there's a lot of stuff working for you beside the visual order. But it's still a lot. It's very important to remember that the visual order is visual. And it's just an impressionist idea. The naive eye doesn't know it's a building or it has this in front or that behind. It doesn't know anything. Those things are gifts from heaven, from the heaven of impressionism. <laughs> so, um, but we could go on and on like that. There's a, here's a, it, all these different edges are like that. But this is one of the farthest back areas in this picture. And yet it's one of the highest contrasts. So uh, 
those things, those things are just reality. So remember that the idea of the visual order has nothing to do with the spatial order, front and back. But there is, but it's still important that when you say, and this is going to be the codicil that you really got to hang on to, okay? So when you say, do I have this? Do I have this right? This effect, right to this effect? You look at them both in your eye at once, and you actually you'll feel a distance. You'll feel the one comes forward by such and such an amount. Now it doesn't mean anything really. It just means that these effects, when you put them side by side, you can see that this one here, this effect is way out. That one is, that was recessive compared to this one right here. And by the way, do the same thing with this one to this one, right? This one has a little more power, but this is still wins by a fair amount. This one starts receding a little bit. And by the way, the intensity of this thing is better than the intensity of, of the light up here. And, it's not, and yet it's not helping. It's not helping and it doesn't do any. So, but if you can understand, that all my job in painting is is to do relationals. So effect relationships are just as important and uh, as, uh, as value relationships or size relationships. I like, and this one here, to laugh about the front here. Here's one of your, here's your, here's one of your leading lights. But, and, and it is projecting uh, because of the, the situation, but it's not a projecting in the same way. It's not projecting because of high contrast. It's projecting in a different way, most uh, which I spoke about before, like in that way that that the highlight on my hand might glow up, and that has a projectiveness by that process of, of, of the values. Uh, 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 what's the right word? Uh, uh, you know, uh, rising, gradating. There's the word. So, but so this feels very forward, but it doesn't have any of the high contrast stuff. But it doesn't have any problem staying in front of the whole building. All many parts of which have. So that's where you just don't want to get confused. And I may have got already confused you. I'm trying to think of another way to say this that will make it less confusing. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, even in this area here, you can see that this. If you looked at this contrast between this green, which is slightly darker, and this brown, and this contrast between this brown and this light, you can see if you look at them both as contrast units you'll see that this one is way in your eye, way faster than that one. And your job is to get that relative degree of, of I call it projectiveness, call it whatever you want, but the relative contrast. And then of course the relative softness, softness of edges if you wanna be sure you're right about your values. And just on the, in, the, in the midst of a never lose sight of absolute lostness, it's like there's spots where a part of a building may completely disappear, say this here, or where else into the, uh, oh, this one's a good example, where this part of the building disappears completely, virtually and totally into the background. And it does it again up here, totally into the background. These losses are really useful places for judging the values of, you know, you'll figure out the value of this thing. If it doesn't disappear up here, then it has to be lighter or darker. And that's gonna tell you something, but it's supposed to be the same value as this, at least right there at that, at that joint. And how many other places can you find the same sorts of things happening? So lostness is a pretty good key. The two keys to values, to effect, is lostness and foundness. And as I said, it has nothing to do with where things are, the pictures front and back. It has everything to do with contrast, with relative contrast. So, uh, and so if you, again, if you blur your eye on a painting like this, and let's talk about method now. If you blur your eye on a painting like this, you could see that you could paint this whole area out, maybe with some vague movement, and you could have this whole thing just pretty much staying together, right? Almost nothing, certainly not early on, anything to draw in there. And we, that is a big deal in the way we think, right? Because the visual order does have to do with what we're really trying to get in place. And your start, you're really trying to locate the power players, get these guys in the right place for eternity, if you can, right? These kinds of guys, these kind of key points, these are spatial table setters, right? This one here, farthest right point in the picture, right? But also just because they're important, because they're, you know, in, a, in our way of direct painting, you want to situate them early because the painting is going to dry and you don't want to have them in the wrong place. So if you blur down and cannot draw all this stuff in here, but just paint color movements if you see them, but make sure you get this in the right place, right? And then not draw all sorts of stuff in here, but make sure you get that in the right place or, or, or this point here or, or, or this point here. You will start, you'll start, you'll start uh, seeing what I'm talking about and why we do it. There's two or three levels of reasons why we do this. And so one of them is the pragmatics of not wanting to move a dark over a light, because as you know, over time, I'm at a light over a dark, but over, because over time, whites lose, they become more and more transparent. And the more nearly they're white, there's less other, the least, the, the lower the amount of other pigments in the white. Uh, 
the more it's going to go transparent. And so if you've already had this 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 lamp, this uh, chimney sitting over here and you move that thing over, all nice for you for today, but in about five years, you're gonna see where it used to be and you will look very incompetent, right? Even some of Sargent's white shirts do that. They'll, they'll do that sort of thing, <laughs> which is pretty, un it's pretty unfortunate. By the way, every kind of, every way of painting has its own sort of built-in weaknesses or disabilities. And that's one that you, that's why you have to take that extra pain because it's one of those things every once in a while you just suddenly find, whoops, right in the middle of the painting that you've got one of those lights that needs to be moved over into a dark. That's one of those reasons though that you can blow your eyes down and say, what, do th what are the things that I, I'm at greatest risk for? But it, the most wonderful thing about it is when you get those three things, which are four things, which are greatest risk, and find the beautiful unity of the rest of them, you're gonna see your composition right there on the spot. So there's this early knowing, which as I've said before, was a key to the reason I even chose to work this, I wanted to know the first day whether this is going to be a beautiful composition. So I wanted the great spotting of the picture, this, the important drawing, the great color relations, and of course the great sense of light and all those things. But I had to cover the canvas in that day, you know, and if you think as an impressionist, you might be thinking, Monet, you might be thinking, how can I do that in 20 minutes? Well, you'd be pushing it. You can't do it really well in 20 minutes outdoors, which I think is why Monet stayed away from his drawing so long. You can put a bunch of notes out there to search for your color, but you're not going to be doing much with the drawing, bringing things together until you've had more time out there, and 20 minutes at a shot is a tough one. Um, you sacrifice something, right? Okay, I think that covers it, but I am going to go all the way back to the original question and make sure I haven't uh, shortchanged somebody here. If my... <laughs> oh, I see what I've got to do. is How do I undo that? Because uh, this thing doesn't want... Oh, it just did, though. So what is that all about? All right, let's just make sure I've covered everything. Where's my begin? Oh, here we are. In trying to understand your, your comparison of spatial and visual order, could you to elaborate on the difference a bit more? Spatial meant the biggest box around things, and the visual order meant the strongest, the weakest. Yeah, so, and by the way, in the, in the, in the spatial order, the, the, the larger shapes and the great angles, the, the, what they call the long lines of painting, those are the more important ones to do well, right? It's more important to have the grand gesture of the painting than it is to have all these dinky little angles, right? And so have that in mind as well, okay? Um, that there are, there are bigger and more important things. In our world, the strongest to the weakest, this, I'm sorry, in the world of the visual order, the strongest the, to the weakest is what I was just describing. That is, the strength is not in the size now, it's now in the, uh, and you make, it, you make the point well, uh, Elizabeth. It's now in who's, who's on first, who's strong? and then keeping the order beyond that, right? Um, so, all right. And then uh, the question of the concept of visual order is causing me a nice paradigm shift. Okay, did you say something? I got off a little bit by even bringing you in here, so I might deal with you later on this one, but I don't understand what a backstraggler is. It's a major mistake you should figure out before moving forward, yeah. So anything on your painting, that's, this is the Baron Grow moment when you ask that question. Uh, Baron Gross said, "When you're painting, your painting should always be in order, so that if you and you've all heard me say that, or most of you, so that if you drop dead in front of your painting, your family could sell it <laughs> because it has inherent harmony. Its parts are all in right relation to each other. So, uh, and so when you're working along, you should always be noticing if the parts you already have down are they in right relationship to each other, and that part which is in the least." in good relationship to the rest. You need to be working on that. Don't go on to the next, to add some new thing into the picture if you have a back straggler. So, but I've covered both of those. Okay, that's, so that's good stuff. And let's see if the, um, uh, Andy, whether the visual order is related to the distance of objects. Yeah, so I think we've covered this pretty well. Okay, all right, so um, good, good. And, uh, oh yeah, that was pretty long too, so all right. Uh, so do let me know if there's more follow-up needed on this one. But, you know, I'm more and more honing in on, uh, or is that word homing in? <laughs> homing in on, on, on the, the na you know, expanding on very narrow points. So don't hesitate to mention, ask whatever you want to do. In the meantime, thank you for all your uh, uh, nice contributions, your uh, comments, uh, sharing, and subscribing. Um, and I was told to uh, let you know that I promised you another live one one of these days soon. So... I think I said six weeks apart. I don't know when we did the last one, but we're due for one within the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned. I'll let you know. But I do mean to have another live event for you where you guys can actually speak to me. It's rather, as it were, in person. Uh, so, all right.
So have a good painting week. I'll see you very next time. Or I won't see you. <laughs> All right. You'll see me.